HBO Home Video presents two explosive new boxing videos, The Kings of the Ring and Emmy Award-winning Sonny Liston, The Mysterious Life and Death of a Champion. First, The Kings of the Ring takes you behind the scenes and past the hype for an in-your-face look at world heavyweight champions. From Jess Willard to Mike Tyson, The Kings of the Ring uses rare archival footage and exclusive interviews to tell the story of the men who've made boxing history. Next, the life story of the King of the Beast is detailed in Sonny Liston, the mysterious life and death of a champion, the troubled tale of a boxing legend who had to fight for everything his whole life until his mysterious and still unexplained death. The Kings of the Ring, an Emmy award-winning Sonny Liston, the mysterious life and death of a champion. Join HBO Home Video's lineup of premier boxing videos, including Boxing's Best, the definitive boxing video series. Overriding right to the joint. Featuring Jack Dempsey, Rocky Marciano, Joe Lewis and Muhammad Ali. Right, the king of the world. Plus, Boxing's Best is now available in a special knockout collector's edition, the Champions Collection. But the action doesn't stop there. Complete your library with these other power players. The middleweights. The best fighter of all time. The middleweight champ, Sugar Ray Robinson. The heavyweights, featuring the big punchers. A crashing right by Lewis, and Ramage goes down. And the heavyweights featuring the stylists. There will be a killer and a thriller and a killer when I get the gorilla in Manila. And finally, boxing's greatest champions. A devastating one-two combination. Relive the greatest moments in boxing with Boxing's Best, the definitive boxing video series. Plus, the kings of the ring and... with our special collector's edition, The Champions Collection. Available now only from HBO Home Video. This is the story of a proud and simple man from a small town known as Brockton, Massachusetts. In time, he would become one of the most feared heavyweights in boxing history. Only one man in this division ever retired as both an undefeated champion and an unbeaten profession. And no fighter ever wore the crown with as much determination and relentless punching power as the man they used to call the Brockton Blockbuster. This is the story of one of boxing's best, Rocky Marciano. here in Brockton, Massachusetts, and that is the house that the Marciano family moved to when they came here from their native Italy. They were not the easiest of times. When baby Rocco was just one year old, he contracted pneumonia, and any thought of his being the heavyweight boxing champion of the world somewhere down the road was way in the backs of people's minds. The thought at that point was, will young Rocky survive at all? In fact, the doctor who was attending to him said if this baby does survive, he's going to do it on spirit alone. And that became the hallmark of Rocky Marciano's career. Sonny Marciano was 10 years Rocky's junior. And Sonny, I think it's interesting that baseball was really the first love for Rocky, not boxing. That, that's correct, Barry. Uh, he, uh, his ambition was to become a major ball player. And, um, of course, this is the playground that he played most of his baseball right here at James Edgar Playground. Uh, I think that Rocky, though, overall was just a, an all-around athlete. He was... He, uh, excelled in football as well for the Brockton High School team. That, that probably was the reason he went into boxing, because uh, of his athletic you know, ability. Rocky started boxing in the Army, but it was a neighbor, and in fact, a neighbor who lived in that house right behind you, Sonny, Ali Colombo, who got Rocky started in boxing, and he was going to be his friend and confidant, not only through his boxing career, but for the rest of his life. Nonetheless, and even with Ali's support and the family's support, his amateur career was something less than sensational. That's true. Um, although he lost a few fights in the amateurs, he, he fought with a uh, badly bruised hand, and one of the decisions was a very badly... Uh, uh, you know, call decision. It went to Coley Wallace, who really didn't deserve to win that fight. Like every up-and-coming heavyweight, Rocky Marciano had problems finding sparring partners and, in fact, people to fight. 
fight at all. And in some cases, he had to go to a sometimes fighter, Sonny Marciano. It was 1952, and uh, Rocky called me up and said, would you like to uh, be my sparring partner throughout the uh, state of Maine? My mother didn't want me to fight, so we, I fought under an assumed name. As a matter of fact, I fought under Zulo and uh, Pete Fuller. Um, it was quite an experience. We uh, put on some good shows. Of course, the, uh, the crowd, upon seeing me, knew immediately that I had to be a brother. We looked so much alike, but it was a great experience. Well, even though Rocky won his first 35 professional fights, there were still the New York skeptics, and it wasn't until Rocky fought a fellow by the name of Rex Lane, an up-and-coming heavyweight from Utah, that he really quieted all the New York critics. On July 12, 1951, Rocky Marciano climbed into the ring to face Rex Lane as the underdog. It was a role that Rocky knew well. He fought back against the odds all of his life. Going into tonight's fight, Rocky Marciano in dark trunks has had 36 professional fights, winning all of them, 31 by knockouts. Lane has a big win over Jersey Joe Walcott and a knockout win over the hard-punching Bob Satterfield. As in all of Marciano's fights, he never allows his opponents to get a moment's rest. This has been his trademark. Marciano, always on the move, trying for that big payoff punch. When Marciano has an opponent, that's when he is most dangerous. Early in round six, Marciano hits Lane with a punishing left. That punch really hurt. Lane is tired now, and you'll see how he lowers his guard. A dangerous mistake against Marciano. Marciano throws a short right, and Lane goes down and out. Marciano knocks out the rugged Rex Lane in six rounds. The fight. One of Rex Lane's friends described Marciano's knockout punch as shearing Lane's front teeth off at the nubs. Marciano was now the top contender to as a Charles Crown. But first, he would have to tangle with the legendary Joe Lewis. Rocky would only to Joe's 45% share of the purse. In the end, this fight would signify the rise and fall of two of the greatest heavyweights in boxing history. By round number eight, Joe Lewis is still in there punching. Marciano in the white trunks shows on his face the effects of Joe's stinging punches. Note the puffiness around the eyes. Nevertheless, it's not the Joe Lewis of all. He's taking a battering too, for Rocky has plenty of steam in his younger fists. Marciano seems more aggressive now, beginning to pile on the pressure. Be beginning to quicken the tempo and the pace, making it tougher on the older Joe Lewis. Marciano seems to be landing more frequently now. Lewis looking just a bit tired, and Marciano just as strong as ever. Bull-like in his rushes, a solid left, and down goes Lewis. A left foot to the jaw, and Lewis takes the count on one knee. Goldstein counting over him. Now he's up at his feet. Ready to meet Rocky Marciano. It comes plowing in. Lewis trying to hold on. Marciano trying to end it right here and now. Lewis using all his ring experience. Trying to hold on. Back against the ropes goes Lewis. A left and a right, and down he goes, and trouble ropes on the apron of the ring. It's all over. He can't get up. He's being helped to his feet now by referee Ruby Goldstein and Dr. Vincent Nardiello, the Gordon's ringside physician, and all of Joe's handlers are looking after the former champion now. But apart from the days he's in, Joe is okay. The comeback of Joe Lewis had ended tragically. For Rocky, it was a $24,000 payday. After cashing the check, he hid his money in his bathroom at the Belmont Plaza Hotel. 
Rocky was a contemporary hero with the traditional values of a simple man who remembered his past. So Rocky Marciano had beaten Joe Lewis, the man who was acknowledged to be the greatest heavyweight champion of all time. But still, there was the criticism. Criticism by the press, who said if they had fought a decade earlier, it would have been no contest. Joe Lewis would have won the fight. Betty Colombo is Rocky's youngest sister. And Betty, you and Rocky shared this house right behind us on Dover Street. You moved here when Rocky was 16 years old. But you, being the youngest sister, always had a special place in Rocky's heart. I sure did. I was 10 years younger than Rocky, and he always treated me as the prima donna of the family. And I enjoyed it very much, admiring him, being the oldest brother. And it was just... A, a fun thing. Well, the family spent a lot of time in that greenhouse right there. Rocky spent most of his time right over here in this park. He sure did, Barry, as did my two brothers, Lou and Peter. You might say that this was home away from home for them. Even though home was right across the street, but Rocky was really the protector of everybody, wasn't he? Yes, he was. He, uh, especially the girls of the family. It was years later, though, that James Edgar Playground paid homage to its most famous resident by erecting that plaque right over there to Rocky Marciano, Rockton, Massachusetts' own heavyweight champion. Betty, after Rocky beat Joe Lewis, the public clamored for a fight with Jersey Joe Walcott. But that was not about to happen for quite a while. And I would have to think that, combined with the frustration that Rocky must have felt over his manager, Al Weil, who was taking 45% of Rocky, which is just an overwhelming sum by any standards, I would have to think there was an awful lot of frustration for Rocky. Well, there was, Barry. And I think that Rocky was ready, and I think that the public was ready. And I think the fact that he had to wait for, for a chance made him hungrier. So while Rocky did wait for that chance, he had to bone up on people like Lee Savole, a 17-year veteran of the ring. It was merciless. February 13, 1952. Rocky had been in bed two days prior to the Lee Savole fight with the flu. Others would have asked for a postponement, but not Rocky Marciano. As the country begged for a Walcott Marciano title fight, Rocky battled Lee Savole. Marciano likes to stay close to his man, working to the body with punishing blows, and then moving to the head with smashing lefts and powerful rights. Boxing experts say that Marciano never lets you get set for a punch, doesn't give you punching room. Although Savold will at times make Rocky miss, most of Marciano's punches get home. Both Rocky Marciano and Lee Savold were leading contenders for Jersey Joe Walcott's heavyweight crown. This fight will determine who will challenge Jersey Joe for that title. Marciano is a three and a half to one favorite in this fight with Savoe. Four months previous to this fight, on October 26th, Marciano knocked out the great Joe Lewis in eight rounds. Nothing seems to stop Marciano as he continues his relentless attack. In the years to come, whenever they discuss punchers, Marciano will always be mentioned. Coming into this fight, Marciano had 39 professional fights and 39 victories. 32 of those victories were by knockouts. Here against a rugged game Lee Savold, he is not to be denied. Savold almost out on his feet. The bell rings for round seven and Lee Savold cannot answer the bell. In the end, the New York Times called it the worst beating in Savold's 17 years in boxing. Savold was hospitalized overnight because his teeth had been smashed into his gums. Rocky was ready for the title, but Jersey Joe Walcott was not willing to comply. So 31,000 fight fans gathered at Yankee Stadium on July 28, 1952, to watch Rocky Marciano take out his frustrations on former light heavyweight Harry Kid Matthews. Rocky never even wanted this fight. It's a shame for Kid Matthews, he didn't feel the same way. Rocky trying to end it with one punch. Matthews keeping his gloves down a little low. That's dangerous. these left hands by Marciano now.
There it is. And down goes Matthews. Will he beat the count? He struggles gamely, but you can see he's out. Desperately trying to get up, and he crumples over, and it's a knockout for Rocky Marciano. And is he happy? Rocky had cleared the last hurdle in his quest for a shot at Jersey Joe Walcott's title. After 42 consecutive wins, Rocky Marciano was on the verge of greatness. When he returned to Brockton, he was a national figure and the pride of a small Massachusetts community. After that fight, Rocky Marciano was 42-0, and and he was a man with everything going for him. Everything, that is, except a heavyweight championship shot. That building right behind us is the Stacy Adams Shoe Company. And Sonny, that was a building that was very near and dear to your brother. That's very true, Barry. Uh, that's where my dad worked at one of the toughest jobs in the shoe factory. My brother would start off his day working out at uh, James Edgar Playground. It's about, oh, 150 yards from here. My mother would call him about five minutes to 12. Rocky would rush home, and uh, my mother would have a fresh sandwich and uh, and a lunch to be brought to my dad. Rocky would run to the shoe factory, get there just before 12 o'clock, and he used to get very upset when he used to see my dad working at, at such a tough job. He promised my dad one day, he said, He walked into the factory one day and he said, Dad, that's it. I don't want you to work anymore. I'm a, you're retired. So now Rocky had to support a family. And finally, the chance came for a heavyweight championship of the world. Jersey Joe Walcott finally gave Rocky his chance. And Rocky's dedication really paid off. In his training camp, Rocky boxed 85 rounds. The champions, 30. And he needed every bit of that training. September 23rd, 1952, the heavyweight championship between Rocky Marciano and the champion, Jersey Joe Walcott. Rocky Marciano retreated into isolation with one purpose, to become the heavyweight champion. Jersey Joe Walcott received 40% to Rocky's 20%, with the same provision set for a rematch should Walcott lose. Rocky Marciano would be the first white man to fight for the title, since Braddock was knocked out by Lewis in 1937. Rocky had made his way from punching an old army bag stuffed with rags to a shot at the heavyweight championship of the world. for the heavyweight championship of the world from Boston, Massachusetts wearing black trunks with a white stripe weighing 184 pounds the challenger Rocky Marciano from Camden, New Jersey Wearing white trunks with a black stripe, weighing 196 pounds, the heavyweight champion, Jersey Joe Walcott. This is round one, and Jersey Joe Walcott has come out smoking. A 22-year veteran of the ring, he goes right after Rocky Marciano. As you see, beating him to the punch, pummeling to the head. Marciano holding on momentarily, the opening minute of the fight. Scheduled for 15 rounds for the heavyweight championship of the world. Walcott goes right after Marciano, and Marciano was staggered. Walcott starting real fast has gone after Marciano. Marciano is down in this first round. He seems dazed up the count of three. His corner was yelling, take the longer count, but he was up at three, and he's trying to keep his feet. Walcott looking to end this fight right here in round one. And now he's gone to round three. And it's still Jersey Joe Walcott. That good right cross landing slightly. Another left hook. Marciano's been staggered time and time again, but he is bull-like strong. A good right hand again by Jersey Joe Walcott, but Marciano is terribly strong. And now we move along into round nine. Marciano has fought back. Jersey Joe Walcott has slowed the pace somewhat. There you see Marciano boring in. Moving to the attack now, taking the play away for the first time from Jersey Joe Walcott. But Walcott is still leading on points here in the middle of the fight. The referee is Charlie Daggett. And he's got his work cut out for him. 
These two men are big and strong, marvelously conditioned. There's the Joe Walcott stepping back, setting up his opponent, Rocky Marciano, the young challenger. Marciano with a good right hand. Dropped his guard for a moment, and now they begin to slug it out in the corner. Trading blows left and right. A left hook is good. And now we go into round 11. It's still anybody's fight, but Walcott is leading, and Rocky Marciano is coming on strong. either hand. Now they begin to miss. As you can see, they're visibly tired. A good right cross. A good right cross by Marciano. Walcott was staggered, but he fights right back. A tremendous fight here for the heavyweight championship. Walcott with another good left hook. Marciano getting to his foe much more frequently now, however. Marciano pulling him around the ring. And now we're in round 13. At this stage, Jersey Joe Walcott is leading on all three scorecards. Seven rounds to five, seven, four, and one, and eight rounds to four. Rocky Marciano has to knock out Jersey Joe Walcott to win this fight, and his corner has told him so. And Marciano is going after the KG, the veteran Jersey Joe. Walcott back here just a little bit against the rope. Oh, a terrific right hand! He's down! He's down! Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and out! New heavyweight champion of the world, Rocky Marciano. And Jersey Joe is still on the deck. Let's take a look at it again. Watch that right hand. As he backs into the ropes, Walcott is caught with it. Here it comes. Bang. What a shot. What a fight. When it ended, fight fans had witnessed one of the greatest slugfests in history. Rocky had realized a lifelong dream. He was greeted by a parade lining the streets of Brockton to pay tribute to their native son. The Brockton blockbuster was the heavyweight champion of the world. Rocky was the winner of the Hickok Belt as Pro Athlete of the Year in 1952, but he still wanted revenge for the only knockdown of his career. In January of 1953, the champ resumed training in the Catskills. He would not fight Walcott until May 15th. Rocky was obsessed with keeping the championship. Hello, my name is Rocky Marciano. And on May 15th, I'm going to defend my title against Jersey Joe Walcott. I'm not forgetting the last time we fought. It was a great fight and Joe fought all the way right up until the 13th round. At this time, he's going to have to come and get the title away from me, and I won't be giving it, giving it up too easy. I'll be fighting real hard. See you all on Friday, May 15th. Thank you. 15 rounds for the World Heavyweight Championship. From Camden, New Jersey, the challenger wearing black trunks with a white stripe, Weighing 197, three-quarter pounds, the former world heavyweight champion, Jersey Joe Walcott. From Brockton, from Brockton, Massachusetts, wearing white trunks with a black stripe, weighing 184, one-half pounds, the world's heavyweight champion, Rocky Marciano. This is the first round. Rocky Marciano has come out fast. This time, Jersey Joe Walcott is backing off a little bit from the on-rushing Rocky Marciano. Marciano won't be caught the way he was in the first fight. Marciano warmed up a long time in his dressing room, going right after Jersey Joe Walcott, the KG Wiley veteran. The referee is Frank Sikora. Marciano advancing, Jersey Joe fainting, that overhand right missed, Jersey Joe holding on momentarily, and they're separated once again, first round of the scheduled 15 rounder, Marciano boring in, good left handed, and there he goes, a short right to the jaw, set down Jersey Joe Walcott. Let's take another look at that short right. It 
was a left hook and a right cross. What's the left hook first? And here's that right. Bango! And down he goes! Jersey Joe Walcott looked as though he was fully conscious of what was going on, although he was obviously dazed. Let's take another look at it. And down goes Jersey Joe. See if he got up in time. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Walcott later explained he blocked out as the count went from seven to ten. Rocky was a bitter man over his short end of the purse, but proud to have retained the championship. I thought it was the right uppercut that uh, really knocked him out, Al. Well, that's what it looked to me like. I thought the left hook was setting him up pretty good for that punch, and you finished it with that right hand uppercut. Is that right? I think the left hook hurt him, and he dropped right into, right into my right hand. So Rocky Marciano was now the undefeated heavyweight champion of the world. And when he came back home here to Brockton, Massachusetts, he was no longer the kid who played baseball at James Edgar Playground. He was now a hero. Nicky Sylvester was a lifelong friend of Rocky Marciano. Nicky, you spent an awful lot of time with Rocky right here where we are now in the Brockton YMCA. Well, every time we came down here, we'd uh, go two or three, four, five rounds, two minute rounds. When he got through, he'd hit the speed bag or the light bag, but his meal ticket was the heavy bag. And when we get through with that, two or three rounds, we'd go down into the swimming pool. Now, I'd watch him from up top, and he'd be in that swimming pool from the water just above his shoulders. And he'd be throwing punches, jab, hook, no overhand right, where he had such a devastating punch. Hooks, left hook, right hook, and that was it. He used to love it. Tell me the difference in Rocky Marciano, the kid that you knew, and Rocky Marciano, the heavyweight champion of the world. Well, when he was a kid, he was never a troublemaker. And uh, we were the ones that used to get the fights from him. Became champion of the world, he never, he never changed. He was always the same. Great guy. Nicky, was there ever a revenge factor with Rocky Marciano? Positively. He fought Roland Stars in Madison Square Garden. That was a 10-round fight. In that fight, Rocky won by a few points. Uh, the people think that because he won it by a few points is because his manager, Al Wyatt, was promoter of Madison Square Garden at the time. So he got revenge with Roland Stars the second time at the Polo Grounds. But I'll never forget, at Grossinger's in Liberty, New York, at the training camp, he was in the men's room. And I went out of my way, I went into the men's room, and I says to Rocky, I says, Rock, I says, you fought Los Stars in a 10-round bout. And I says, and the people think to this day that you lost that fight. You have got to get in there and show them what you can do. And he did. He annihilated him in the 11th round. He could have dumped them in five or six, but he actually held them up. He actually held them up. He continued, the 11th round was over. Let's go back and revisit that fight now. It happened September 24th, 1953. The Polo Grounds in the Bronx, New York. 44,000 people on hand. Roland Lestarza and Rocky Marciano, fight two. As Rocky prepared to fight Roland Lestarza, word got back to his camp. But Lestarza claimed Rocky took so many punches, he had to be punch drunk. Rocky turned to his handlers and said he wasn't only going to knock the challenger out, he was going to punish him. New York City fans are thinking that the fight will be a repeat of the first contest between these two men, when Marciano in the white trunks won a tough decision over the durable Lascarza. So far, the fight has been extremely close, with Lascarza winning the early rounds on his boxing ability, and Marciano coming on strong as the bout has progressed. Marciano gets Lestarza cornered, and the two men mix it up in a short, furious exchange. Lestarza dances away, but Rocky stays right after him. Roland Lestarza had won 37 professional fights in a row when he lost to Marciano in their first bout, and he still has a brilliant 54-3 one-loss record. 
Marciano lands one of his patented blockbusters. Lestaz is hurt. Lestaz is all set. Marciano moves in again, throwing that dangerous weather from all angles. Lestaz against Belden with another jack right. He's almost completely helpless. Jumps in and stops the fight. Lestarza suffered bone damage and broken vessels in his arms. He had to pay the price for his words. Rocky came away with $174,000, some of which he may have hidden in unconventional places. Rocky also was known to lend money generously to his friends. Nine months later, over 47,000 came to Yankee Stadium to see a heavy favorite beat a respected challenger. Rocky had received a death threat before the fight. His relationship with his manager, Al Wilde, was crumbling. The bout with Ezra Charles would go down as one of the most grueling in boxing history. From Cincinnati, Ohio, wearing white shirts, weighing 185 and a half, the challenger and former heavyweight champion of the world, Ezra Charles. Charles. And his opponent from Brockton, Massachusetts, wearing black trunks, weighing 187 and a half, heavyweight champion of the world, Rocky Marciano. Marciano. tonight weathered the storm through the seventh and eighth rounds Charles handed out as much as he took but now we're more than halfway through the fight and the tireless Marciano has again taken command Marciano's favor. 
and he's definitely the stronger fighter now. He had won a unanimous decision over a courageous Ezra Charles. Referee Ruby Goldstein remembered he had not separated the fighters once in 15 rounds. Charles, his voice reduced to a whisper from a Marciano punch to the Adam's apple, thought he won the fight. Three months later, 35,000 packed Yankee Stadium for the rematch. Rocky wanted to KO Charles early to dispel rumors he had lost the knockout punch. Foul weather had postponed the fight for two days. Few gave Ezra Charles a chance. Unfortunately for the challenger, Rocky was one of them. This is the second time these two have met. Marciano winning a close 15-round decision exactly three months ago. Ezra Charles trying to keep Rocky Marciano off at long. Hits him with a good right hand. Marciano, strong as a bull, though. Good right hand by Rocky Marciano. Charles may be hurt. Marciano going after Ezra Charles. And Charles goes down. He's up at the count of two. Marciano swarming in. Looking at the end of the fight right here and now. Charles fighting back well. That's the end of round two. The eighth round has hardly started before Charles is to open a cut under Rocky's right eye, but this was to be the final dramatic round of the fight. And from here on out, it's just a case of the bleeding champion measuring his man for size. Marciano's eye and nose are badly cut. But his mean, hard punches are definitely weakening the challenge. Down he goes! Once more, a chance to see the punch that sent him down. There it is! He's on his way. Rocky is all business. Charles getting up, but he's dazed, and the champion now has him at his mercy. The knockout punches are on their way. Six devastating punches. And out! That's all, it's all over. One. Two. Three. Four. And that's it. In the champion's corner before the eighth round, trainer Charlie Goldman had told Rocky to get him now or you'll bleed to death. Miraculously, Rocky had come from the brink of disaster by pummeling Charles to the canvas. No one could take the title from the most determined champion in ring history. Rocky Marciano! This is Marciano's sporting goods store just outside of Brockton. It is owned, not ironically, by Peter Marciano, another of Rocky Marciano's younger brothers. Peter, you were at that Ezra Charles fight, and that cut was an awfully nasty cut. It was, Barry. It was uh, something that I shall never forget as long as I live. I 
was very young at that time, and I recall walking into the uh, locker room after the fight. And any fight that I was ever at, uh, I would go in after the fight and, and greet my big brother, and he'd usually give me a big hug and a kiss. And this particular fight, I kind of backed off. I looked at his nose, and, and I, I must tell you, I actually got very ill. His nose was just split right up. He was actually able to open it up, and it was a sickening thing. And uh, uh, it was something that I shall never forget. Do you have the feeling that were that fight to be held in this day and age that it is possible that Rocky Marciano would have had his undefeated streak broken because of that cut? Barry, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to answer it this way. Rocky had a very unique knack of uh, under adversity coming up with the, the big fight, the big punch. And uh, I believe um, uh, if he were boxing in this day and age that uh, he would have known that he was close to being... Uh, getting beaten, he would have come back and, and done just exactly what he did in this fight. Peter, we've talked about the fact that Rocky was a hunter in the ring, but outside the ring, the man had a sensitivity, I know, and he said time and again to the people like yourself who were close to him that he didn't want to be like others who had preceded him. Yeah, he, he gave that an awful lot of thought. He did a lot of reading. Uh, he wasn't the stereotype kind of a fighter that, that you may have met back in those days. Rocky was a well-read guy, uh, an excellent speaker, and uh, uh, Rocky just never wanted to get into that syndrome where he was, uh, you know, uh, in trouble financially or uh, in trouble in any other way. Did it surprise you when Rocky decided to hang it up when he did? Um, not really, no. He had mentioned it to me and other members of the family that he really had had enough. I think uh, the one thing that he did say that kind of told us all that he might be getting through was it was getting difficult for him to go back into, a, into the gym. He even one time made a statement that he really couldn't even stand the odor, that certain odor of a gymnasium. And, and uh, he said, if you can't give it 100%, you got to back off. And that's exactly what he did. Nonetheless, he got it together enough to have two more fights. The first one out in San Francisco against a very, very tough Englishman. May 16, 1955, Rocky Marciano was a 10-to-1 favorite in his title defense against Britain's Don Cockle. But The Rock had been decked by a sparring partner in an unenthusiastic training camp. The pre-fight buildup clamored for an upset, but the odds would tell a familiar story. We well, had a pretty tough fight last time, Rocky. How's the nose now? Is it in good shape? I think so. It's, it's been fine so far, but I think it's still a problem to us. Cockle slugged it out for the first three rounds of Marciano, but here in round eight, he obviously shows the lack of power and stamina that Marciano possesses. Cockle is a good professional fighter. He's the British and European champion. He had 61 wins, 11 losses, and 36 KOs, but he's really taking it now. Marciano hitting him almost at will here in the eighth round, and the question is, how much longer can Cockle last? Cockle weighs 205 pounds. He's still flabby around the middle, as you see. His weight, though, is down from previous fights. Rocky weighs 189, all muscle. A jarring left hook. Cockle being battered around. Marciano going after him continually. He just never lets up. But Cockle is tough. He's tough and courageous. Marciano misses every now and then, as you see, but he keeps throwing punches, and most of them get through. Cockle batted, staggering around the ring now. Another good left, another good right, and a left by Marciano. Cockle still fights back, but his punches lack sting and power. Marciano as strong as ever continues to bore in here in the eighth round. It's been all Rocky Marciano since the early rounds. How much longer can Don Cockle last? Marciano with tremendous endurance and strength. Throwing those punches all the time. Never letting up. But Cockle keeps his feet. A tremendous right, and Cockle is still standing, another right and left. How much more can he take? On his feet, Marciano might be getting all weary, though he doesn't look it. Still throwing punches, and so is Cockle. 
Another left and a right by Marciano. And Marciano can't put him down. A tremendous exhibition of courage by Cocker. Staggering on his feet. Marciano with a left hook and another left hook. And down he goes through the ropes. Through the ropes. And he fights his way back. Now we're in round nine, and Rocky Marciano goes right after Don Cockle again, but Cockle is dead game. What a right hand, and a left, and down goes Don Cockle. He's sprawled on the canvas, as you see. He battles to his feet at the count of five. He's trying to continue. He's still dead game as Don Cockle, Marciano, Throwing almost wildly now. Rocky is wide open, but he has no fear now of Cockle, and Cockle is down again. When will the referee, Frank Brown, stop this fight? Cockle looks bewildered, dazed, and there he goes once more, and Brown stops the fight. The referee stops the fight. The champion gave the British title holder a terrible beating. Al Weil and Rocky banked another $130,000, but later Rocky would learn of an accusation that $10,000 in promotional profits had been skimmed by Weil. Although Rocky defended his manager publicly, the relationship had taken a decided turn for the worse. Uh, how'd you feel when you got in with this fella? Did you think you were going to have as hard a fight as you had? No, I didn't at first. I didn't expect such a strong man in there. He was uh, very strong in the first two rounds and a very durable fighter. I thought I hit him with uh, plenty of my best punches and he took them well. In fact, he came back I, in the eighth round pretty well himself. But four months later, Wilde scheduled Marciano to take on light heavyweight champ Archie Moore. The threat of a hurricane postponed the fight for a day, but a crowd of over 61,000 flooded Yankee Stadium to see Rocky Marciano's triumphant farewell to the boxing world. I'm glad that the time has finally come when I, can, when I could accept the fight with Archie Moore. We all know he deserves it, and uh, I think you're going to see a great fight on that day. Moore felt and feels that he's going to take the championship. Uh, how do you feel about that? Well, he still has to prove it to me on September 20th at Yankee Stadium. Uh, I do understand that he is a confident man, and uh, I guess most of the challenges have been that way also. Introducing from San Diego, California, and Toledo, Ohio, wearing black trunks, weighing 188 even, the light heavyweight champion of the world and challenger, Archie Moore. Moore. His opponent from Brockton, Massachusetts, wearing white trunks, weighing 188 and a quarter pounds, heavyweight champion of the world, Rocky Marciano. It's round two. Archie Moore, the light heavyweight champion of the world, has over 175 fights. And down goes Rocky Marciano with a terrific right cross. Marciano fights back. He got up too soon, however, at the count of three. And now he wails into Archie Moore. Now we move along into round six of this fight. And Archie Moore has been outboxing Marciano. He opened a cut over his eye in the third round. But Moore is getting caught and down goes Archie Moore here in the sixth round. An overhand right caught him flush on the jaw. Marciano has been getting stronger. And the canny veteran Archie Moore has been trying to fight back. He's tough, he's game, he's experienced. But he can't outslug Rocky Marciano. Rocky has him against the ropes, and Moore is still dangerous, though. Moore has looked for this fight for a long time, and now he's going all out to try to win it. But Marciano is so much stronger, pummeling Archie Moore against the ropes. But Moore makes a miss. Nevertheless, those punches get through.
lefts and right by Rocky Marciano. He just doesn't let up. Keeps pouring in on Archie Moore, and Moore is fighting back. But his punches lack the power and effectiveness of Rocky Marciano. Marciano, hammer-like almost, hitting at Archie Moore, backing a veteran into the corner, swinging away lefts and rights, and Moore can't keep that buzzsaw off him. Down goes Archie Moore, shaking his head as if to say, what do I have to do to stop this man? And Rocky comes right after him. Rocky, seemingly tireless, spun all the way around at the end of the round. Now we're in round eight, and Rocky Marciano has not let up one bit. Still throwing leather from all directions. Archie Moore trying to keep him off. Marciano ever advancing. Again, you see him pinned against the ropes as Marciano pummels away with rights and left. And down goes Archie Moore. Moore trying to regain his strength. Tiring badly now. Here in the eighth round, he's on his feet again. Now we go into round nine. Marciano once again hitting Archie Moore with everything he's got. The game veteran trying to stay in there with more like Rocky Marciano who just doesn't stop throwing punches. He is exhausted. Archie would be the Brockton Blockbuster's 49th victim and 43rd knockout. Rocky had earned over $4 million in the ring and $2 million for personal appearances. Unlike other champions, he didn't blow his money. It was hidden, invested, and put in banks. The undefeated heavyweight champion was ready for retirement. Winner by a knockout and still heavyweight champion of the world, Rocky Marciano. I would like to announce my retirement from boxing at this time. Why? I uh, promised my wife that I would retire before the month of May arrived. Uh, we were on a vacation in South America when I made that promise. I uh, did never really get hurt in the ring, and I feel perfect physically, and uh, probably still had two or three good fights left. We asked you the question, who gave you the tough, tough uh, Jersey Joe Walcott in the title fight. I like to profit by others' mistakes, and if Joe Lewis couldn't make a successful comeback, I will not try it. Not only did he want to spend time with his family, but a California investigation confirmed Weil had taken $10,000 from Rocky's share of the cockle fight. He said he would never fight for Weil again. Thirteen years of the good life went by, then Rocky stepped onto a plane at Midway Airport in Chicago for a flight to Des Moines. On the eve of his 46th birthday, Rocky lost his only fight. The plane crashed two miles south of Newton Airport in Iowa. On Sunday, August 31st, 1969, the world said goodbye to a hero. There have been many great world heavyweight champions in boxing history, but none have carried the crown with as much dignity and humility as Rocky Marciano. His legend will live forever. And so the boxing world had lost the champion, but Mrs. Pasqualina Marciano got his son back. Pasqualina, tell me, first of all, let's go back to Rocky's childhood. You didn't really want him to be a fighter. No. Why? Well, because it's a dangerous game, really. But once... I figure, I figure, my son, you know, I know he's going to win, but I'm afraid if the other fellow gets hurt, because of the way I feel if my son gets hurt, the other fellow's got a mother, too. That's <laughs> the, the, the only 
thing I didn't like. Uh, you didn't worry too much about Rocky getting hurt. You worried about the other guy. Yeah, I worried hurt. about the other guy too. Yeah. Once he decided that he was going to become a professional fighter, did you pretty much just resign yourself to the fact? Well, what am I going to do? My son's going to be yes, a boxer. Yes, I told him I didn't wanna, you know. But he says, "No, mother, I'm going to do it." So and then I pray the blessed mother and the God, you know. I say, "Well, it's up to God now." He's old enough now to do what he wants to do, especially he went in the army and he started over there. And I used to hear a little bit here and there, see, you know. You never saw Rocky fight, though? No, never. Pasqualina, even though you didn't go to the fights, did you have a routine that you went through when Rocky was fighting? I used to have a couple of friends, you know. And uh, I used to go to church, like Mrs. Uh, Lucy Parciale and Mrs. Uh, Nis Gendermaso. And uh, Jenny's mother, Miss Flamina Alfieri. And I used to go to church and I light so many candles. And then you know, I go home and nobody put the radio, no news, you know. And then we just pray like and we say a little joke, you know, the passing time. And then before you know, I hear the telephone ring. It says, Mom, and it was Rocky. I win again. And everybody was happy, everybody get excited, you know. They go to the club, but the people come in, all my family, they used to make something to eat, you know. It was really, really a very exciting time when my son was in his career. Everybody said Rocky really likes to eat, is that true? Oh, yes, yes. Another thing, you know, used to amaze me. Because you knew all the time, him and my husband, that he was going to be fight, my husband gave give him more steak. And me, I couldn't understand that. So one time, I even had a little fight with my husband. I said, why can you give Rocky more steak than the other? So he turned around and he laughed, you know. This was all the time because he wanted the son to get strong, you know, because he had to win the fight. And my, my husband, you know, he was a little bit fight himself when he was in the army. He was very strong man, my husband. Everybody say, Rocky looked like me. Maybe the action, maybe the, the personality, but when it comes to strength, he had a hands just like his father. And he, maybe you see one of my husband's picture, you know? Yeah. Ask willing to tell me when all is said and done, the people who are watching this program, how would you like them to remember your son? I want to remember that uh, he was a great champion, little rough and fight, but he was very gentle very soft spoken and he love all the children i'm pretty sure that the people can remember him is a happy and very humble champion it is really probably the most subjective question in sports who was the greatest heavyweight boxing champion ever in the case of rocky marciano i think the record speaks for itself <laughs> This is Rocky Marciano. When I held the heavyweight title, they called me the Brockton Blockbuster. You'll find out why. I enjoyed it. I liked it. I never really knew fear. I never was really hurt. And I just think that in my prime, I could have fought with anybody alive. I tried all other sports, and although I liked them, there wasn't anyone that I really excelled in until I took up boxing in the service. And when I did that, it not only came easy to me, but I enjoyed it, liked it. It sort of fitted my makeup. This has been a presentation of HBO Sports.